Good evening. Uh, it's now 6.09, and I am going to call to order uh, the Lawrence Alliance for Education meeting of November 10th, 2021. Um, as we start, I'd like, I'd ask that we all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you. Uh, before we get to public comment, which is the first order of business, I'd just like to uh, recognize uh, our veterans. Uh, I'd like to recognize everyone who has served and continues to serve uh, our country uh, with a specific focus on, on, on citizens of, of Lawrence who uh, do that work for us. So just want to recognize um, our veterans for, for everything they do. So thank you. Okay, so we have public comment. As a reminder, it's uh, two minutes for public comment. Uh, Maria is going to help me uh, keep time. And so after two minutes, we do have uh, several people signed up. So I am going to hold this pretty firm to two minutes. So apologies in advance if I'm cutting you off. But uh, I just want to make sure we have time to hear everyone who, who has signed up. So uh, the first person is uh, Mr. Mali. Good evening, honorable members. Homayun Mali, 53 Chester Street. Tonight, we, the parents, are proud to see, to support para professional from Breen School. I remember my child, I, I remember my son, my grandchild went to the Breen School. The para professional are the foundation of our education in our city. That is shameful for a long time. They have not received any raise. They have not received any review. We need a new contract for paraprofessional. Since the paraprofessional of the Breen School and across Lawrence Public School working so hard, they deserve recognition. All the parents appreciate every single paraprofessional that works across our public school. It is time after receiving funds from the pandemic, help and support our paraprofessional. They need more raise. It is shameful for our city that our paraprofessional that working with our children, they're receiving wages less than employees of Mark McDonald. This is the below the minimum wage. If we cannot support them, we cannot have a better education for our city. For our professional across the Lawrence Public School are the foundation of education of our children. We have as a city, as a great city, that a city of immigrants, we have absolute obligation to support our poor professional and make sure they deserve the best contract with the best support from our citizen, and we wish him the best, good luck in the contract negotiation. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Suzanne Suliveras. And if, um, so just, just real quick, appreciate the enthusiasm. I'm just going to say if Antoinette Olerich, I believe, uh, is the next speaker. So if you could just make your way down and be ready after, um, after Ms. Oliveras, please. Thanks. So I'm going to ask, I'm sorry, just before you start, Mr. Leveris, that I'm going to ask that we're, we're going to listen to every single speaker that signed up. We really want to hear what they have to say. I'm going to ask that you please not shout out during or from the crowd. So just appreciate that in advance. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Suzanne Solivares, and I am the proud president of the Lawrence Federation of Paraprofessionals. I am here representing 371 paraprofessionals of Local 3900. This evening, I would like to share our concerns about the district's refusal to increase all paraprofessional pay, as well as hiring above the designated pay scale for new employees. We are not here for the district to stop hiring at these rates, but to increase the hourly rate of all the dedicated paras in the district. We have been told by the superintendent reason, the reason for these new hired employees is it falls under the category of exceptional circumstances. We understand the need for our paraprofessionals. However, for the district to ignore the loyal, dedicated, and devoted paras is upsetting. Our students are the reason why we're here every day. We love our jobs, and we don't want to leave them because we can't afford to pay our rent, 
put food on our table. All we want is to be treated fairly. After trying to negotiate, the district's last proposal was to increase wages of less than a quarter of the paras. Is it the district's position that the remaining de dedicated paras are not worthy of any increase? If so, this is going to provide a negative effect on morale across the district. As of today, 98 paras have left the district for other employment or career paths. This is a great loss to our students. At the last meeting, it was stated the LAE is here to financially support Lawrence Public Schools on hiring additional staff. And we need to be competitive with wages across the Commonwealth. We agree with you. This issue has been brought to the superintendent but was pushed back, stating they could not afford it financially. I am asking the LAE to work with the district to increase the hourly wage of our paraprofessionals so they can feel respected and appreciated. Many of our dedicated members are here tonight to testify what it is like to be a paraprofessional in the city of Lawrence. Please listen to them. Really listen. Their stories break my heart. It's impossible to think that these workers can balance their own personal lives on such a little pay and be able to give their complete focus to their students. I am asking you to consider all paraprofessionals in exceptional circumstance and help us earn a living wage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Antoinette, all the rest, please. And, and if I just may, Anid Santiago will be next, and after that, I believe it's uh, Michelle uh, H E A. Sorry, can you, if you can help me out, Hebert. I don't want to. Hebert. Sorry, I can't read it. My bad. So it's Anid, and then uh, Michelle Hebert will be after that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Antoinette Ulrich. I don't have a speech like everybody else. Um, I work with uh, Lawrence High School. Um, sub-separate students, uh, non-verbal, non-mobile. Um, our kids are a little difficult to deal with. Um, myself and Ms. Dahlia, who's not here, are the two in that classroom with four students. Um, we change them three times a day, feed them twice a day. Um, they're very difficult to deal with. We have a new student that just recently came in, very, very aggressive. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty difficult for us especially she's 60 something years old um, and she's doing this with me. She weighs at least 120 something pounds and we're lifting kids that are bigger than her on and off a changing table. Four, uh, three to four times a day, two to three times a day, all depending upon what their needs are. Physically changing their clothes constantly, um, changing their diapers, um, anything from being, getting, if they're harming themselves, or um, falling down, getting hurt. This is what we deal with each day for these students. Two paras, four students, all day. Stipend at the end of the year, $1,000, and we change them every day for however many times a day we are actually in, how many times we are in the school for, for the year. I don't think it's fair. I just feel, you know, we do need more money for everything that we do. I know we all love our jobs, but I just feel that we should be appreciated a little bit more than we are right now. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Enid Santiago, 25 Bellevue Street, Lawrence MA 01841. We're here for our students. As an example, that no matter where you came from, you can always succeed. We want our students to practice the golden rule of treat others the way you want to be treated. But double standards make us look like hypocrites. In front of our students, you're not treating us the same ways as others. We know we need more hands on deck. I'm promising a good amount of money is good. But why those who have been with you for a long time, that stay during COVID, we still here for you and our students. We don't deserve the same considerations as the others. At the rate the races are going, we would never manage to get that race. We would never amount that money. We want students to learn about respect, kindness, equality. Those things are not applied to us right now. You fail to show any of these things. You fail to show respect to the staff that have worked for you for so many years. We need to get students to understand that equality means getting everything necessary to be at the same level as others. But you failed to show this since fairness is not the same as equality in your dictionary. Kindness is the most important of them all. 
but you fail to show kindness every time negotiations end up in the ears. Thank you. All right, just Mr. Before you, before you start, um, just after we'll have Mason Pekarovich and Julisis Mariero will be um, after. Go ahead, please. Yes, hello. Um, my name is Michelle Hebert. I have been in education for 36 years. I have never, ever worked in an establishment outside of the school system. I've been a teacher, I've been an AT, and now I'm a para. And I am here tonight because I wanted to speak on behalf of all the paras and all the support staff that have such disrespect from you and your staff that you have the audacity to hire new hires at $22 at the top of the pay scale when you have people standing here with their masters in education, qualified teachers who, who teach in a sub-separate classroom with their certification in Massachusetts to teach, but we choose to be here to support young teachers, to support staff. We work hard every single day. We cannot even pay our bills. We can't pay our apartment bills, our food bills, our gas bills. The cost of living is going up. And when I hear from new people in this building, oh, I just got hired and I'm making $22 an hour. And I've been in education for 36 years and I don't even have $20 an hour. You started. You started this meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, and the last phrase is justice for all. We need justice. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, thanks. Hi there. My name is Mason. I am 27 years old. I use he, him, his pronouns. I am a paraprofessional in my third year at Lawrence High School working with our ILP team. Um, my students, their primary diagnosis is autism. I see myself as an essential person for my students and my colleagues because I also have autism. And that is something that I use, a struggle that I can use to benefit the young lives that I see every day, not just those with autism, but those without and those who don't understand it. Teachers who don't understand it, who think that people, I'm getting, I'm getting off base. Um, I can't afford half my rent. I can't afford my medical bills. I can't go to the doctor. And I, trust me, I need to go to the doctor. Um, I'd like to be able to buy my spouse a present for our anniversary, which is on December 1st, and then also a Christmas gift, which is just three weeks later. But I can't do that. Um, if, if I don't see a spark of hope, an ounce of change in the right direction, then this will be my last year with Lawrence Public Schools, because I already know that there are other districts who would love to have me, teachers who have left Lawrence and gone to neighboring districts who will take me because I am essential. This is the first time in my life that I've known I have a, I have a purpose. It is with our students. They deserve me. You do not. You do not. And for anyone to sit up at that stage and pay attention to anything less than the people coming up to speak to you, stepping away from their families, their evening off, because guess what? We don't have school tomorrow. Um, and you have the audacity to have a phone or a folder or a tablet. Shame on you. Shame on you.
so ju just one sec, sir. So just after your list is just um, Julio uh, Reigns or Reina. Sorry, I can't read it. Reigns, okay, my apologies. Uh, and then Michael um, Brasnahan. Brasnahan, thank you. And after that will be Nina Faria. Just that's, and then I have a few others, but that, that'll be the order for next. Thank you. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Julesis Marrero, and I am the building representative at the Arlington School. I was born and raised in Lawrence and still reside here. I would like to express how utterly disappointed I am that I have to stand here and explain why we as paras deserve better wages and better treatment. The district constantly states that they want members of the Lawrence community, members of the Latino community, to be more present in the public school systems. Yet here we are fighting for a living wage. They want faces our students can identify with, stories our students can relate to, but they aren't doing enough to support us, to guide us, to acknowledge us. In fact, it seems all the odds are against us and it is impossible for us to succeed or progress in an environment where we are not valued. We are trying to make a difference in the community we love, yet struggling to afford living in the community we love. So I simply ask in return for this community to love us back because we too are important, we matter, and we too are worthy. Though it is a common misconception, Paras are not just here to fill the gaps. We are here to build stronger foundations that can better equip our students for a successful future. I should not have to try to convince anyone that paras are just as important as anyone else. So as a fellow Arlington Gator and Lawrence Lancer, I ask that the district do better in making us feel worthy, valued, and competent, as I am a living, breathing example of the student you wish to see succeed. So please, help us succeed. Thank you. Good evening, board, and good evening, Paris. Um, my name is Julio Ramos. I'm uh, the LFP vice president. I work at the SES, and I coach baseball at LHS. And I'm also a proud Lancer. And I've been a volunteer in my great city of Lawrence for many years. And my biggest pride and joy is working with the youth of Lawrence. Board members, I believe that you should really take time to reflect on the concerns and the points that our paras are making tonight. We are having paras leaving the district at a record number and all they want is to feel respected, be treated with dignity, and have a fair wage. I personally feel our city is in a crossroads right now and it's up to us to decide where we're gonna take it to in the next follow um, couple of years. We're in a fight for the future of our kids. We need your support to do what's right and to do what's right for our kids, most importantly, but to also do what's right for all your employees. I think it was Richard Branson that once said, your biggest asset in your company is your employees. Right? I believe that's true. Because if you treat us right, and you treat your employees right, that's your biggest asset, that we could take care of the biggest jewel in our city, which is our youth. Thank you very much. Michael Bresnahan is the next person up. And then after Michael, uh, Nina Faria. My name is Michael Bresnahan, uh, born and raised in Lawrence. I taught 20 years in the Cambridge public school system as a middle school math teacher. When I retired, I came back home. I'm happy to serve the uh, students and community of, of Lawrence at the Gilmet as a math para. And I just want to say a couple things. The continued existence of this board at this stage of the game, to me, is an ugly example of systemic racism. Because, in essence, it says to me that you don't think the people of Lawrence are responsible enough 
and intelligent enough to run their own school system. So if you had some morality and some political conscience, I think you should resign. The other thing I want to say is the diversity in the school system is not in the teachers. This is your diversity here. And you have hamstrung us in our contracts and not paid us enough. And you talk about diversity, why don't you put an active recruitment program with these people? Support them for the Intel test. <laughs> Recruit them. I spoke about this two years ago and there's been really nothing done. So I put a challenge before you. You want to have diversity in your teachers? You actively recruit these people here. Good evening. Fer Ms. Ferrier, sorry, just one second before you start. Um, next, we'll, uh, after uh, Ms. Ferrier will be uh, Jenna Ferraher, uh, <laughs> then Felix Gonzalez, and Sandra Ruiz. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good evening to all the parents that are standing here and the teachers that are supporting us. I've been working as an early childhood professional for 22 years. Pretty sad that McDonald's makes just as much as I do for the 22 years that I've been in the system. I work with the preschoolers. We are the seed to your babies. That's where we start out. I chose to stay in my city with our children, the children who need us. To ch I chose to do this important work with our children and I deserve to be treated better and valued and compensated fairly. The cost of living, clothing, utilities, rent, childcare, medical, etc., have gone up since the pandemic. We, however, had not gotten an increase in pay. And newly powers hired are making more than the powers who have been loyal employees to the district. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It's a disgrace and it's a shame. As we stand here for 22, 23 years, to have new powers hired for the amount of money that they're getting when I'm not even nearly making close to what they get. That's an embarrassment. That's an embarrassment. Okay? Not all, I'm a single parent. Not all of us are able to have, you know, um, to have the help from the state. I short, I'm not one of them. I'm a mom with a son with severe disabilities. And I could barely make it for my rent. I could barely make it for my bills. So that, that's a slap in our face. Have some consideration for us because we work really hard with these children and we give our damn best to these babies and all the kids that we support. Thank you. Next, Jenna. On that note, let me tell you something. The teachers cannot make it without the paraprofessionals. Thank you. Jenna Farraher, please. Are you all set? Yep, thanks. Hello, my name is Jenna Farraher. I'm an associate teacher at Spark Academy. I graduated summa cum laude from Southern New Hampshire University with my bachelor's in history. I hold a provisional license to teach history grades five to 12, and I'm currently working on my master's in special education at Merrimack College. I'm also a very proud graduate of Lawrence High, class of 2009. I am highly, if not overqualified for my position, as many paras in this room and who are not here are. And in my six years working for this district, not once has my pay gotten me above the federal poverty level. On a daily basis for six years, I have taught every single subject, supported every student, every teacher, administrator, every other para. I advise, mediate, problem solve. I even have to talk people down from panic attacks. And for what? So this district can pay me less 
than I was making at my retail job, limited brands paid me all year round, and the benefits were even better. All the paraprofessionals that are not in this room right now are either caring for their families or they're at their second jobs. They asked us here to pass on a message to this board. Pay us what we deserve. This district is under fire for the lack of support to students and staff. The staffing crisis is a crisis. And yet this district continues to ignore our solutions. They ignore our roles as professionals. The less the board and the district listens, the more staff will leave for the surrounding towns, all of whom are paying better than Lawrence. Enough with the unfair wage practices constantly committed by Lawrence Public Schools. I sincerely hope that you take our professional and experienced words to heart tonight and under consideration. Thank you. Uh, Felix Gonzalez. Felix Gonzalez, thank you. And then Sandra Ruiz will be the last speaker. Good, good evening. My name is Felix Gonzalez. Um, I'm just surprised about um, knowing that some people that power, new power professionals are getting paid more than those that have been working for five years. Um, I've been working for more than five years and uh, also worked during the, the COVID situation. And um, it's obviously unfair. It doesn't make sense that people who starting to work now get paid more than those who have the experience and the knowledge. So that's number one, um, it's unfair. Um, we, second, we, we talk a lot about equi equ equity. Um, so we, we teach this like every day, teachers, powers when we substitute, um, everybody in, in school. So I think this is like the perfect mom moment to speak up. I think we're not applying this. Um, if we're gonna talk about equity, I think this is a perfect moment. We're not getting paid what paraprofessionals deserve. So I think we, we should consider that. Um, also, um, I think we, we have to practice what we preach, in other words. And um, also, I think it, it harms education because many, many power professionals are, as you can see, tired of this unfairness. And what they're gonna do is that they're gonna resign. They're gonna look for another job where they pay them more. So my advice is that um, you consider us, that you pay power professionals what they deserve and for the better education. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm here to talk about the dedication and love that the Paris have for the students here in our community. We're here for the kids. I am born and raised here in Lawrence. I choose to work for Lawrence High School because I love my city and I want to give back to my community. I want to talk about truth. The truth is that we have been underpaid for years, yet we are still grinding and giving it all. Make no mistake, we know our worth. The district seems to think that only, the only worth we're worth is a minimum when McDonald's is starting at $17. We have Paris here who have given and dedicated half of their lives to this position in making less than $16. We are the ones who is the most underpaid in the entire Lawrence Public Schools. That should tell you that we are here for the kids and our community. We have worked in unacceptable conditions, including through a pandemic. We have teachers that have been out on medical reasons, and it's the paras who substitute the teachers, who do the lessons plans and fill in for months with no compensation, and all it's never, I'm sorry. We have posted positions for the paraprofessionals at a starting rate of 2244 makes no sense when we have existing paras making less than $16. How is it possible that a new hire para is making more money than a starting clerk who is starting at 20? 
You have given us zero acknowledgement, zero recognition, and zero appreciation. You have taken advantage of us for years. Let me tell you something about these paras. They're here for the love of these kids and the community. We aren't looking to get rich. What we want is to be treated fairly and equal. How do you sleep at night knowing that more than 70% of the staff is underpaid? The district has the money to give every person a reasonable raise, but you rather use your money on curriculum or make up high pay positions and then, then give credit where it's due. How about all these positions that are, have been posted and added hot sign on bonuses that equals to more than $100,000? We have parents who work with high needs kids who are very aggressive. They punch, they bite, they scratch. Teenagers who need diaper changing. And who does all this work? The Paris. It's not an easy job, yet the Paris do it all with dignity and love. Where's your compassion for these Paris? I hope you know that you have opened a can of worms when you decided to hire paraprofessionals at the rate of $22.44. That means you are certain in admitting that the position is worth that much. So why not make, the right, make it right and do, do right for everyone and raise everybody's rate? We know our worth. Let me ask you, what is loyalty worth to you? Because that's what we have been to this district, loyal. And we want to be more than 2244. Anything less than 2244 is unacceptable. Thank you. Um, th thank you. We we've reached the end of public comment, um, and we're going to go into our in our agenda uh, shortly here, but. Uh, I just want to say, and I speak for myself. I don't, you know, can't speak for the board, but um, you know, uh, appreciate the all of you coming tonight to share your concerns, share your experiences with this board. Um, you know, I, I want to make sure that you understand that the last thing we want to do is communicate anything other than the deep appreciation for the work that you do on a daily basis, and clearly that's not been happening. So I'm gonna work with this board and the superintendent to make sure that with urgency, um, we, we take a look at the issue. I mean, we understand and I heard clearly that it's not so much the issue of like new paras and you know, like we want new paras is what I understand and you know, but it's making sure that the paras that are here also uh, feel valued, feel recognized, uh, feel compensated. Um, uh, and, and, I and I hear you. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is, again, I'll, I'll work with this board, uh, with the superintendent to make sure that we listen to your concerns and, and act. And, and hopefully, you know, working in partnership with your union, we can come to a uh, resolution in a way that, that recognizes uh, the work uh, that, that you all do and recognizes, again, the, um, the, the place where the district is at and wanting to make sure that we can uh, continue to support our staff to, to support our kids. So. Thank you for coming out tonight. You're obviously welcome to stay for, for the rest of the agenda, but um, we will work with urgency to make sure we, we address this. So thank you. Um, so that concludes public comment. Um, we're gonna turn over to the superintendent's report in a second. I, I will ask the board, I'm gonna ask the board though, um, for, for a, um, if I have a motion. So we received You'll see on the agenda, the last item on the superintendent's report, there's a letter dated today that we received a donation. Uh, and the donation, oh, it's on here, it's from Playball for about $160,000 in equipment for, for youth, uh, for our sports programs. So what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna ask for a motion to allow us to have this on here, on the agenda, uh, so we can vote on it tonight. It's not the typical order so what we moved. do. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, and again, we're just voting to put it on the agenda. So all those in favor, just say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you.
Yeah. Ventura. Do they understand that we can't react to this because of open meeting law? I just want people to, I want, I want folks to understand. Yeah, they, they know. We're, we're going we're gonna to work. They, I've said it. I mean, I think. I know, but just so that they understand that we can't discuss this tonight, even yep. though it is an urgent. So, guys, hello. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just want you all to understand, because unless you think... We, we are not actually allowed to have a discussion about all the commentary that you brought up because it, it's not an agenda item that's been properly noticed by open meeting law. I, so just so that you understand that we're totally taking it in and we're not being unresponsive, but Ventura is trying to follow the procedure that we have to follow as a public board. So that's why you're not going to get response from individuals visual board members tonight or we're not going to have like substantive discussion of the item but we are taking it in and we will take it up and address it so i just wanted you to to make sure that folks understood that okay thanks jess i'm gonna recess for like 30 seconds just to let people <laughs> exit it <laughs> All right, so we're gonna start reconvening here in a second. I'm gonna turn over to, to the superintendent momentarily. Go ahead and um, as we're coming out of the recess, you can just set up the, the next item we can start. All right, thank you. We're gonna, all right, we're going to resume the agenda and with the superintendent's report. Great, thank you. In a moment, Maricel Goris is going to provide. Sorry, Dave, we're going to do the LHS update first. Thank you. Yep, so we wanted to give you an update from the high school. The highlights today will include what the task force has been doing. As we get that set up, you should know that yesterday we had a meeting that included workshops with parents. Today, the task force met again, and I also met with the student cabinet on this issue of safety and positive school culture climate. So you just want to, we'll keep giving you updates on that work. 
and our learnings, and more importantly, the action steps that have taken place and that continue to take place throughout the school year. It's in the, it's in the folder. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to, while we're getting it set up, we're gonna, I'm going to just do the donation so we can get that. Great, wonderful. So in your material, to put it as an agenda item. Oh, sorry. Yeah. In your materials, you will find a letter addressed today to myself from Playball, and it states that they are doing an in-kind contribution from New Balance of 900 pairs of shoes and 1,300 articles of apparel, so all the goodies for our students to be able to continue to stay active in the amount of $160,953. So um, we ask that you approve that donation. In so doing, then that gives them the ability to deliver these shoes and apparel sometime this weekend. Great. Do you have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? All right. It passes. Thank you. Thank you. LAE board. Um, I'm here to report on the positive climate progress at the campus. Uh, so what you'll learn here is all the goals and action steps that have been recommended by the task force team, which is um, comprised of students, staff, teachers, LHS administrators, community leaders, and parents. Um, one of the prevailing themes was around implementation of policies. So the task force has identified three goals and action steps. Number one, establish a culture that is safe, caring, predictable, and consistent. Action steps include the lower school ninth and 10th grade students and staff reviewing the code of conduct and a code of conduct and power school workshop for families that was held yesterday, November 9th, and where over 50 families attended. Many of those families are interested in becoming additional members to the task force. Our second goal was to establish a positive reward system for students. This includes an action step of quarterly student awards assemblies to recognize positive behavior, academic achievement, and civic engagement, and that will commence the week of November 9th. Our last goal under implementation of policies is around increasing adult presence on the campus. As a result, we've posted the following positions, four school culture specialists, four school safety officers, and a center for restorative justice manager, along with an additional adjustment counselor to the six adjustment counselors we've already added this school year. We are establishing a campus voluntary advisory committee that will indicate criteria for volunteer opportunities across the campus. This is an agenda item for tonight's task force meeting, which is happening at this moment. Uh, our additional act goal under implementation of policies are around uniform policy. The campus TLT, the teacher leadership team met and are continuing to discuss ways to reinforce the policy. Um, across the campus, there's an implementation of the campus-wide student picture ID system. And as a, uh, an additional action step is for us, we have purchased and received Lancer logo t-shirts by Academy Color for each student. This would 
um, allow for students to adhere to the uniform policy and full implementation of that would be December 1st of 2021 um, with the goal of the student IDs to be completed and implemented for the week of November 15th. Our second prevailing theme is around mental health supports. The goals and action steps related to this theme are listed as maximizing college and career planning advisory and flex block to build stronger relationships between adults and students on campus. So every Wednesday we've assigned CCP theme is a mental health wellness focus with descriptive activities and restorative circles to happen. That's across the campus nine through 12. We're working on establishing an on-call crisis intervention team and system. This would consist of a rotation schedule at the Center for Restorative Adjustment for adjustment counselors, the deans, the school culture specialists, and the guidance under the guidance of that manager to respond to students through a QR code um, when they need assistance. Next, we have increasing opportunities for students to be me mentored by members of the community. And so members of the task force will be identify who, when, where, and how. Um, and that planning will happen during this term, term two, with implementation for term three. Our last item, or our last goal for under this mental health theme is creating a community of care for our LHS adults. And we are uh, providing professional development on the trauma-informed teaching practices through the Ellie Center and self-care um, during professional development time. The last theme that came up consistently across members of the task force and um, members of multiple stakeholder groups was around joy and celebration. As a result, um, we identified the goal of expanded student platform to affect school culture and climate. This entails establishing this campus student government, which has already met with the head of school three times at this point. The results being that there's a campus-wide events calendar. They've agreed to conduct morning announcements of celebrations, provide feedback regarding each individual academy stu student climate, and contribute to the design of the Center for Restorative Justice at um, the campus. Opportunities for students to connect to the larger LS LHS community. Students and faculty really talked about really coming together as a united campus. So the staff has agreed to conduct campus-wide joy activities once per month, created by students and conducted by each respective academy for example, Spirit Week, a flash mob, and a winter ball. An additional goal is for, to give students the tools to change the narrative. So student government members agreed to publish a bi-weekly newsletter to share and celebrate the amazing efforts happening across campus. This is the task force meeting calendar for the next few meetings. We're, they're meeting today um, at five o'clock. December 2nd, December 16th, and January 6th. I'll add a few more highlights of other groups who have been working in concert with the task force. We've also met with the chief of police, Chief Vask, and our SRO, Sergeant Caraballo. The students, the, the superintendent student cabinet have also been working on this. And they also identified that students needed to better understand the code of conduct. You know, this issue of fairness and not understanding consequences is quite prevalent with teenagers, as you can imagine. And when I spoke to them, I shared with them, I can see how that feels unfair, because to them, justice means that they would understand each individual consequence and discipline. I shared with them that every student deserves privacy and that, that they can relate to. I said, imagine if I shared with the world what consequences I gave you as an example. Of course, nobody wants that. So they can, once you talk to them in smaller groups, they better understand why it's not possible to share publicly the consequences and disciplines. But they, they need to better understand the code of discipline and what that process is. 
The other things that students were very interested in and the chief agreed to is better understanding the role of law enforcement on our campus. And as you know, our students, we have students who were publicly arrested. And not only is that um, a very traumatic and concerning but also they want to know what does that mean? Like what's next for those students? The chief agreed and our sergeant agreed that they would also come to the campus and talk to the students about those very serious consequences of having to show up to court, of being summoned, of potential charges. And then um, lastly, this issue of PowerPoint, the power school, excuse me, and the workshop that some families received yesterday was also came up in the task force because power school houses attendance, as you all know, but more importantly, each time a student is out of the classroom, that goes into power school, and even in my own school, I get a little message that says, your son was not in class. So giving the tool to parents on an app then helps parents also understand, hey, why wasn't Cynthia in class today? I just got a message in my app. And that way they can check in with their own students, like what's going on, why aren't you in class? And that gives families more information, real-time information. So we'll do a lot more of those as well with families to better understand the code of discipline. How do you keep track of your students' attendance while they're in school at the end of the day, the next day, so that you can also have the information you need to follow up with your student? And lastly, I've met with many, many, many community members. The outpour support has been impressive. We have enormous amount of love in our community for our students, our teachers, and our staff members. There's a big group of pastors, as you may all know, in our community, a hundred of them. I met with several of them on a Zoom call and then several of them in person and they're at the ready and willing also. For them, it's a bit trickier because we have to treat them like volunteers. Milagros runs that. I've forgotten her last name, sorry. And, um, sorry? See. Si. And they are also at the ready to support us and we're also working with them. So I just wanted to connect the dots in addition to what Maricel has already shared with you all. While the task force remains our more formal structure and group that is engaging and making very concrete action plans. There's other members of our community who are also part of the larger um, work. Great. Uh, we'll pause there and see if there are board member questions on, on that update in particular. I have a question. Go ahead, Dan. Um, on slide, um, I don't know what slide this is. We have a side with, that talks about the additional adjustment counselors. What's the total adjustment counselors on the campus? Um, with that additional one would be seven adjustment counselors. All seven new this year, fiscal year, or? Yes, yeah, seven new this school year. That's oh. in addition to our guidance counselors. <clears throat> You're hiding, and, and by the way, this task force is in response to the most recent incidents at the campus, or is this a long-standing task force? No, this is in response to the most recent incidents on campus. Right. Um, and so you, you're going to add four cultural specialists, four safety officers, um, a manager, and you're going to bring the restorative justice, I'm sorry, the adjustment counselors to seven. That's great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I just have a, a question for Cynthia. As a result of um, what's been going on uh, within the schools, are we having better um, access to the parents? Are the parents more responsive to receiving texts or messages or in participating a little bit more in, in their students' lives? Sure, great question. We did have an open house in early October. I think attendance there was pretty comparable to years past. I think what we have is more individual outreach because the number of students who are involved with these incidents, of course. And we do, of course, have additional families who have been concerned with those incidents as well. In terms of more larger events, the attendance remains the same. But the, uh, the, com the communication via, um, you know, uh, text or emails, or it has improved? Oh. 
Yes, so our families prefer two ways. We had surveyed them. One is email and the second one is text. That is their, their preferred way of communication. So we, we communicate a lot more, <laughs> that's for sure. And, um, and then they reach out again when there's um, mostly concerns specific to their student. Go ahead. Um, Cynthia, I think we discussed this and um, I just brought it up on my phone. The initial meeting or the interviews with the students prior to the task force beginning, um, I was really interested in what the kids had to say. And what, when I read through all their comments and everything, what struck me was that the kids really want policies followed, they want rules, and they, they want people held accountable. And if we have rules, they want, they want them to be followed. And I found that very, very interesting. Um, are we, as we establish these, or we have, for instance, the uniform policy, we've, we've slackened on that in the past. And I think, you know, we, when you read some of this stuff, the kids want kids held accountable. If there are kids wearing their uniforms and they see others that are not wearing their uniform, you know, the, the reaction is, well, why should I bother if that child isn't going to get punished for not wearing the uniform? But, um, that really struck me, that the kids want other kids held accountable and they want the rules followed. Yes, and... That's just my comment. You know, based on the information that was gathered prior to this report when the task force met. Yes, and as a result of trying to uphold the uniform policy in the beginning of the school year, we've depleted our resources of uh, uniforms at the campus. As a response, we've then purchased t-shirts that match the color of the academy, so that way parents could bring the uniform, students can still be in the academy colors with the Lancer logo and be in uniform. Now are the parent, are we giving those to the students or are the parents, we're giving them? We are. Mm -hmm. Have we considered some kind of a school store on campus where um, uniforms would be accessible to the families? Yes, we have a school store on campus on both sides of the building. Okay. Thank that are you. Accessible. You're welcome. Well, go ahead, then. Yeah. So we're saying part of the issue with the uniforms is that there was access issues. They weren't having, the families weren't being able to buy the uniforms. Yes, the polos and the khakis, because of the production issue and the. Get a hold of them. It wasn't like they. It wasn't like there were right. families that just couldn't afford them. They, it just wasn't the, There's a distribution gotcha. issue as a result of the pandemic, okay, and so resources are very limited. Even in ordering, we try to order um, polos ourselves, and it's a back order of three to six months There's for some... our large quantity. So we, we're, we're, we have the adolescent development stage of wanting to have your individual identity added to the pandemic impact of supply and demand, and we have um, a challenge in enforcing and keeping a uniform policy consistent across the campus. So we did the best that we could in identifying what we can purchase, what would be aligned to the uniform policy, and be able to provide that to our students. Yeah, I think as of, as of yesterday, it was something like 71 ships sitting in Harbor in, L yep. in L.A. with goods. So up. everyone start creating your, your Christmas gifts for your families. <laughs> <laughs> start now. <laughs> Great. Um, I, I am going to move us on, but um, I didn't see any more hands. So, okay. I'm going to move us on, but I'm just curious, um, and I know it's a broad question, but appreciate the updates on the task force and the work that's been done. Um, I also know that uh, the headmaster had presented just sort of actions that, you know, the school had been doing already, so I won't go those. But I guess just in general, like, how's it going? I mean, I know, you know, we met last month and there was one incident that got media attention, but that, that's sort of the media. I want to just know, like, day to day, like, how's it going? How's staff doing? How are kids doing? What are we seeing? Are we seeing any... Um, 
anything that you can sort of talk about as an impact of some of these actions and what you you know the headmaster and you have already been putting in place just at a high level like how's it going yeah for sure i think our kids will continue to test you know boundaries and they definitely test discipline limits mm. from everyone and that's in their nature we, we call them entrepreneurs. They like to do things that are not acceptable to us in any corner of the building when it's not being closely monitored. And But overall, you, you, you know, we have not had incidents in the same manner that we saw earlier this year that was very concerning to us. I think that this is going to be a lot of work for everyone all year. It's unpredictable. We don't know when our students are going to have big emotions and outbursts and um, violent reactions to minor things or big things. They have a lot of pressures. They have a lot of things that they're still dealing with. And I think the staff is doing an excellent job. The teachers are working really hard. The administrators are working really hard to maintain kids engaged, to keep them happy, to keep them focused. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate in the plan, um, you know, the work on... Um, just like the positive reward system and recognize because again in the comments Pat you've mentioned to this in the comments from students I heard a lot uh, about students um, also feeling like what was being spotlighted in the media and external was all this negative stuff right and and um, wanting to make sure that we're highlighting you know um, honor society early call I mean all these programs and things like that but the fact that um, like student council and meeting to plan events and on campus for spirit and to celebrate. Like, I think that's really important just to continue to build the culture and, and you know, uh, give kids an opportunity to step up and uh, lead some of those things with adults. And, you know, um, so just want to say that I, I think that work is really important as well in the positive culture and letting kids who the majority of whom, you know, are probably doing what they need to do and, you know, wanting to celebrate what, what's being done. So just want to make sure that Feel free to invite us if it's appropriate to any of those events, and you know we'll prioritize being there. But just just really appreciate that. Pat, go ahead. No, I would. When you brought that up, I agree with you. We need to celebrate the kids, and we don't have a student yet as yet on this board, and I think that would be a, a good first step. Inviting or however the, the students choose their representative, mm -hmm. it's important for that student to be on here and to bring back you know, the messages from us and we listen to that student. Absolutely, with this established student government, I'm sure that uh, that would be happening shortly. And in my closing comments, I'm gonna talk about both the budget committee later and the committee on, on finding students, which we've done every year. So we'll talk about that later today. So, all right. Julia, yeah, number one. I just wanna add um, to those comments that I was very, surprised and happy to read in the uh, editorial uh, uh, portion of the Eagle Tribune that uh, they, uh, the board actually uh, wrote a piece about the students and, and basically called out people by saying, you know, this is not just happening in Lawrence, this is happening throughout the nation and the, the kids from Lawrence deserve better which is something that a lot of times we don't hear mm -hmm. from the, the local media about the good things that happen, but they, they did have a good piece on that. I don't know if everybody had a chance to I read know. it, but it was really good, and I just want to um, highlight it to make sure that they continue to do that for our kids. Thank you. Uh, Superintendent, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Marisa. Okay, next we're going to have a presentation on student support services. So Assistant Superintendent Mary Toomey in a moment will also... Sure, is that right? You want the video first? It's up to Mary. I'd like to introduce it if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Great, thank you, Mary. Testing, mic on. Testing, oh, there we go, all of a sudden. Good evening, everybody. Mary Toomey, Assistant Superintendent. Just before we begin, um, and I'm really pleased to be here with our annual update regarding student support services, but as the person who is charged um, with leading student support services for the district, I do feel compelled just to acknowledge the service and dedication of uh, our critical support staff members 
who serve our most vulnerable children and students every single day, most of whom um, are identified with uh, significant disabilities. Um, I just feel it would be um, inappropriate for me not to acknowledge that, uh, how much we appreciate them every day. Um, a bit of good news here. We had the opportunity through Massachusetts Special Olympics to ask some of our schools if they would like to be involved in a year-long initiative to become a unified champion school, really sort of championing, championing um, inclusivity and uh, what it means to be unified and what it means to support all students together. Um, and we had the opportunity to kick this off with a rally at uh, nine stops, uh, 14 schools all together. And this is just a very short two-minute um, montage of that day on October 28th. We were kind of loud in the city, so you might have heard us, uh, thanks to the police and the fire department. Um, we had a rally that was really wonderful and uh, put smiles on lots of folks' faces. So we'd like to share that with you now for your enjoyment. I just want to point out there's a longer version that our own LPS Media put together on the district's website. So if you like this, be sure to watch the other version as well. Thank you. We have been visioning inclusion for a long time in Lawrence. We have uh, been, you know, bringing our students together in unity. We have been celebrating differences in children of all abilities. And when we had the opportunity to join Massachusetts Special Olympics in this initiative, our schools just jumped at the opportunity to be part of Unified Champion Schools. They feel that they're a part of something. They, they know now they're not separate. We're all in this, and it's all for one. Seeing all the smiling faces, and seeing the joy and the excitement. When they hear music and their attention's on them, they, they're, they're show boys, you know, they're hot dogs, they love it, and they'll, <laughs> they have a blast. And so again, it just it chills down my spine every time I see the kids with a huge smile on their face, and they're just loving life. So thank you for that acknowledgement, and I uh, want to thank everybody who helped us do that. We only had a couple weeks to put it together, and um, as a community, we all came together, and we got all our kids out and about, and it was just a wonderful, wonderful day. So thank you for that. Um, just going to give you some updates here, and then I'm happy to answer some questions that you may have. You've seen this slide before. Uh, we're in our third year of a reset for the Office of Student Support Services. And you may recall that our first year was cut a little short because in March, uh, March 13th to be exact, is when we were sent home in our first year. And we persevered throughout the pandemic to think about what student support services need to look like. And we've come back really strong this year in terms of um, how we're paying attention to that. A very strong response to instruction and intervention team so that we are providing intervention and support services for students at all tiers. Um, hopefully before they get to referral for special education or other services that they may need. Our student health and wellness, Nancy Walsh is in the audience tonight, but hiring a director of, uh, of uh, health and wellness was so important. Uh, we couldn't have predicted when we did that how important it was going to be going into the COVID uh, situation, but um, we're so pleased to have her. 
uh, school counseling, onboarding. You heard tonight about the school counselors that we onboarded this summer. Uh, more to come, more to come in the district as well as part of our SOA plan and really strengthening the amount of behavioral health supports that we have for children across the district. Um, we couldn't have predicted when we wrote that SOA plan how much they were going to be needed in terms of regulation support, trauma support, uh, and getting our kids back regulated back into the, into the schoolhouse. And so we're really depending on um, having uh, very experienced and uh, very um, well qualified school adjustment counselors, social workers, uh, behavioral health specialists. Um, I've been really pleased with uh, a few recent hires that are coming on board. Uh, social emotional learning, uh, you heard a little bit about it in terms of some of the interventions that we've started at the high school. It's critically important that we have those supports in place. And at the top of our stairs, of course, is special education and um, how we have to service all of our kids and uh, with all of the disabilities. I'll share a little bit more of that with you in this presentation. But if you're looking for very detailed information about our programs, the Special Education Program Guide has been updated for 21-22, and you can find that on the district's website. So in terms of um, health and safety, I thought you'd be interested to just have a little more background around what we've been doing in the schools. Um, you know about the routine COVID pool testing that's been going on in the schools. and. Um, so it started around the end of September. So when I took this data, um, we were only about five weeks in, and we were already up to over 4,000 um, individuals a week with consent to participate in these pools. The pools only have about five individuals in them. And um, you know it, they happen every week, once a week on the same day in the school every week. And of those, only 36 positive pools were identified so far when we took this data. And um, it allowed us to identify the asymptomatic individuals and then go the next step in terms of getting PCR tests, et cetera. So that's really helpful. And that's increasing and continuing. The other thing that's happening is test and stay. And test and stay, as you may know, started um, rather softly with just four schools uh, about the middle of October. And as of the end of October, the 25th, we're now offering test and stay at all schools. And so um, when we took this data, we had 224 participants. And this is for someone who's a close contact. So not someone who is tested positive or who is um, um, you know, symptomatic, but someone who perhaps was within three feet of an individual uh, for more than 15 minutes, and that person volunteers to get tested and can stay in school, the student, uh, for every day, and they're tested every single day. Of those, only one converted to positive when this data was taken, so we think this is a wonderful program to have and to help us keep our kids in school. And then finally, obviously, symptomatic testing. If any individuals are presenting symptoms in school staff or students, then um, our nurses are doing exceptional work right now. Their job has really changed in the climate of COVID. And um, you know they're doing the Binex Now testing to make sure that um, we're getting them uh, where they need to be. And we also continue to do attestation forms for staff members, continue to remind parents that if their child is having any symptoms or not feeling well, they should remain and stay at home. Very, very important. I shared with you last um, year, I think it was a little later in the year, but IEPs by disability. What's interesting about this data is that our enrollment overall in the district in the last year or so has decreased somewhat, and I think that continues to be the case, but not so much with students with IEPs. That data has ro risen um, in the last uh, 18 months. Um, we're right about at the same level that we were back in February now, and we expect that number is going to grow. And what is significant is when we disaggregate the data by disability type, which is what this slide is showing you, um, those children with autism uh, is our now second highest disability in the district at over 15%, and followed closely by communication, which hopped over health um, and is now um, higher. So um, you can see that it's relatively about the same as where it was 
when I presented this to you before, but the autism and the communication disabilities are growing and it's something that we're looking at when we consider additional staffing and um, the needs that we have across the district. So looking at what that continuum looks like of service delivery, one of the things that we're very proud about is this commitment to inclusion that we have in our district. And when we look at you know, how many of our kids are considered fully included, you can see that that number is over 75% of all students with IEPs. And then we have another couple hundred kids who are considered partial inclusion. And then that group of students who are in the substantially separate classrooms uh, or our district programs. And that's disaggregated for you so you can see that the students in the independent learning program, the ILP, those are students who may be on the spectrum, may have an emotional disability. Um, that's our largest group when you look at who are those students who are in the substantially separate programs. Um, and then we look at the therapeutic day schools at the annex, um, at the elementary and middle school for schools for exceptional studies, and then the high school at SES. You can see those numbers. Our out of district numbers are a little lower than they have been for the last couple of years, and uh, most of those students are uh, in state um, in out of district placements. Um, something I thought you'd be very interested in, you know, this reset that we did a couple of years ago, we talked about, you know, needing to have more services, needing to have more support, dividing the district into four geographic zones, um, having each one led by an independent special education director, increase the communication and service delivery, and that continues. So I wanted you to see that just this year, these are the number of FTEs under student support services that we've grown. So 72 positions added. You can see we filled 41 to date. I joke that you know my office on the third floor is like the HR annex because we interview so much. And we still have positions to fill, but we're really proud of um, you know, all of the additional supports that we can offer to students. Um, our co-teaching uh, program that I told you about is going very, very well, supporting students with, uh, with learning disabilities and um, also um, the related services that we're uh, giving to children. The school adjustment counselors I told you about that we've hired 12 so far out of the 21 that are in the SOA plan and um, uh, continuing to hire board-certified behavior analysts, the BCBAs. New, um, and you may remember that at our last meeting, Sarah Vanville, one of our RNs, um, shared with you um, really the job changes that have happened as a result of COVID um, in our schools for our school nurses. And Nancy and I had been discussing the opportunity to add certified nursing assistants, CNAs, uh, as another pair of hands for our RNs as someone who could make those, those phone calls that are much needed to parents to get more information or to you know, um, help the parent understand what the child needs. And um, as of today, that number has changed. We have hired our second um, CNA. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, we're hoping to get a cohort of 10 CNAs across our district. So kudos to Nancy for all the work that she's doing, um, interviewing and onboarding those CNAs, I think they will be a welcome addition to our staff. I wanted to share with you a little bit about our early intervention integrated pre-K programs, just so you have a little background on what I'm about to tell you that we're experiencing. So you know that our pre-Ks focus on a play-based learning uh, uh, system, um, common core standards, it's a half-day program, it's two and a half hours a day, it's um, inclusive, it welcomes students with and without disabilities. And because of space limitations, as well as the need to have specially designed programs, it's not always possible to have these programs in neighborhood schools, so we do end up busing kids. Um, and for kids who are eligible for SPED services, the ranges of services vary depending upon the integrated classroom and the needs of the students. And the exact type of therapy that happens is determined by the team at the initial IEP meetings. And so we're required to take a look at kids um, and we receive referrals from early intervention agencies, many of whom begin working with children at birth. And we receive that referral starting with the children when the children are two and a half years old. The evaluation happens at age two years, nine months. We have a dedicated team that does the evaluation in an arena format. 
We've just revamped the location of that at the Rollins School. Um, it's very welcoming. Parent comes in with the child. They stay for about an hour or 90 minutes. Parent uh, completes some um, checklists for the team, and the child, uh, through a play-based model, uh, receives all of their evaluations that they need. So very proud of what we've been able to do there. So this chart just shows you the number of sessions of integrated pre-K that we have available in the district. Breen, Hennessy, Rollins, those were the schools where integrated pre-K was happening until this year, where we saw a need and we asked the Lawrence Family Academy to add um, four more sessions, so they're half day. So this is the number of sessions, not the number of teachers. And then if we multiply each session by 15 students where we like to cap it, you can see the number of seats in the second column that we have across the district. Now only half of those seats, or seven, in each classroom, in each uh, program, only half of those seats are allocated for students with a disability because they have to be matched with a typically uh, achieving student. That's the goal of integrated preschool. That's why it's called integrated. So what we have available at present is about 38 seats left in integrated preschool. And what I want to show you is that um, as a result of um, the school closure and uh, being out for a little while, um, the evaluations that um, we probably would have completed in the last year were fewer than what we had experienced prior to that. So already this school year, we have 43 completed evaluations, another 32 in process at the time I took this data, on 1019, and another 75 that were pending, for a total of 155 with only uh, 34 um, days of school in. Our highest ever um, referral and evaluation record for early intervention is 300. We, in a typical year, do about 250. So at 150 with only 34 days in, we know we're going to exceed that this year. Um, it, it might trail off a little bit as we get after the holidays, but what we're doing now is that we're working on plans for additional integrated pre-K seats because we feel that we're going to use those 38 seats very quickly. Not every parent decides uh, to enroll their child in the district uh, for one reason or another, but we need to be ready because um, when, if the child is identified with a disability, then we are obligated to offer that child a seat in an integrated program. So I wanted you to be aware of that. This is just a little more about Unified Champion Schools. wanted you to know that it's a full year program. It's not just about Unified Games Day that happens in the spring. We will have that, and it will be a very exciting culmination. But all of the schools listed here that have opted in and made an application to be a Unified Champion School they will be do doing events and activities all through the year in three areas. Of course, unified sports, we all know about that. Youth leadership, very important that we give all of our students opportunities to lead. And whole school engagement, which is what we all witnessed on October 28th, getting the whole school involved. So it's just really exciting. And I hope you had an opportunity to see that we made it on the front page of the Tribune. So very excited about that too as well. Um, another uh, new opportunity here for our paraprofessionals is the opportunity to become a registered behavior technician. And so what that is, it's a nationally recognized uh, certification in behavior analysis. Um, they assist in providing direct behavior services, and they do that under the supervision of a uh, BCBA. We made a partnership with the New England Center for Children We've already enrolled 50 paraprofessionals in the 40-hour course. They're doing that on their own time. We've offered them a stipend to do that. Um, and they each have a BCBA as a supervisor helping them through the program and preparing them for the certification and license exam that we think will happen in March and April. We just received um, authorization to um, add another 20 because we have so much interest in this program for paras that would like to um, receive this certification. So that's very, very exciting that that's happening in our district. We also, um, after a partnership this summer during ESY with Roman Music Therapy, we um, entered into a partnership with um, some of their um, therapists 
to come in to our substantially separate classrooms um, weekly. First half of the year, we're doing about 22 classrooms. In the spring, we'll do about another 22 classrooms and to really help kids um, uh, regulate and provide uh, meaningful opportunities through music therapy. Um, it has a very calming effect on them and uh, the parents, the teachers, everyone is really loving it. So uh, very excited about that program. We told you this was coming. Jigsaw Education, after a curriculum adoption committee, took a look at what was out there that was standards aligned for working with our students in some of our substantially separate programs and mainly for our students who are on the spectrum. And um, it uses, it's based on applied behavior analysis. There's several different components of it. And we'll, we'll, we will also be um, launching the SEL component. Um, that hasn't started yet, but all the programs on the screen here have started. Professional development has been provided. And we're very excited about uh, the opportunity to have this um, integrated um, program um, that is both uh, digital and also um, hands-on classroom libraries in each of those classrooms. So um, very excited that the teachers are getting this, this kind of support. We asked our schools if they were interested in launching a regulation and sensory support team, and 13 schools jumped in to do that. We're providing them with training um, around what it means to uh, really think about uh, sensory breaks working in their school and helping the kids to regulate. Um, consistent regulation tools and breaks are effective methods for many students. And the return, as we know, to in-person learning has revealed the need for this enhanced attention, especially uh, for students who are at the younger grade levels. Um, this is meant to prevent and mitigate episodes of dysregulation. Uh, it's sort of like going to the gym. You know, you would get a workout sort of um, menu and you would follow that all throughout the gym. And kids who have a sensory diet do the similar. They go to a corner of the room um, where there might be some um, balance beams or, or bean bags or other things that they can use um, to, uh, you know, to sort of feel uh, more in control of their um, emotions. And so creating these classrooms, helping staff understand how this works for children on a regular basis um, really prevents the dysregulation from happening if they can have access uh, to this information and these uh, diet. So the schools are really excited about it. The trainings are going very well. We're training full staff. And then the schools are ordering uh, sensory materials to either create a space in this school or to create corners in their classrooms um, and flexible furniture, bean bags, rockers, little rockers, um, other things where kids, you know, can really get that stimulation in a positive and effective way um, really helps. Um, the other thing that you may remember from SOA is this idea we had to launch student support and stabilization teams. And so we know that kids who are struggling emotionally or behaviorally um, do need that opportunity for some crisis intervention, for some stabilization. We heard about that from the high school. We need this support across all of the grades and all of the schools as well. And so that's happening now. We have begun the hiring for our first team. Um, the SOA plan includes as many as four teams, four teams of four. We want those teams to include very skilled uh, social workers, psychologists, counselors, BCBAs, and I'm very pleased that we've been able to onboard um, a few of those folks. The first one will be starting um, on Monday of next week, so it's very exciting. And we'll deploy, deploy these teams uh, in pairs um, to one or more schools that um, may need to observe a child who's having some difficulty. They will um, consider their behavior antecedents. They will work on functional behavior assessments, develop intervention plans, train school-based staff. They will also be the, the sort of intermediary that brings the community and the agency support to the family, to the school and uh, does all of the wraparound services that the schools need. So we're very excited. We're working on a process for referral, and uh, we'll be launching that out to the schools very shortly. Um, so this is really, we're talking about tier three students, those kids who are the most dysregulated, and 
um, those are the ones that we want to really support. Uh, I think I went one ahead. Um, just wanted to share with you just a couple of pictures to end this up. On November 2nd, we had our full day, uh, PD day. The kids were out of school for election day. And we had a make and take full day with our uh, colleagues from Gray Associates on assistive technology and um, you know, using augmentative um, and alternative communication tools for kids that do struggle with communication. And as you saw in the slide, that's a growing population for our district. And so you can see here some of our speech um, and language pathologists making communication books. They have their laminators out. Um, they're, they're learning all kinds of both low-tech and high-tech, iPads, et cetera, apps. There's plenty of apps that do this work as well. And uh, they had a great time. They're already using these materials, and it's going very, very well. And then another, just giving you another um, piece of what happened on the second, we um, had all of our independent learning program teachers in Paris learning more about applied behavior techniques with our lead BCBA, Kristen Pass. And she did that with a very large room of people at the Partham School. Um, and that went very well. Just such an asset um, as well to our teams. So that's the update for uh, fall of 2021. Happy to take any questions that you might have. Great, Mary, as usual, thank you for a very thorough presentation. Really appreciate the information. Um, any, any questions, comments from board members, Julio? Uh, thank you, Mary. That's really a thorough, and it's really nice to see all the good things that are happening. I just had a, a question regarding the um, uh, the behavior technicians. How many of the uh, the existing paras have taken advantage of this, and have any of the new ones that were just added? Um, applied to participate in this? We tried to get it off the ground last year while we were remote. And because they didn't have the support of the BCBA being with them together in person, um, we didn't get anyone to the licensing exam. They didn't finish. So it is a 40-hour commitment. It's self-paced. But our BCBAs now are you know, giving them a schedule, and they're checking in with them weekly. How many hours did you complete this week? They have, you know, six months to do it. So there's plenty of time. And now they have someone who is like their, their mentor, their sponsor, who's checking in with them and is going to supervise them through it. So we're really hopeful that this spring we'll be able to report that we do have a cohort of registered and licensed um, behavior technicians. But that will be new for us. It's all of the folks that are in it are our existing paraprofessionals who, um, who opted into doing it, yes. And with so many, it filled immediately. We had 50 spots that we're now offering another 20 spots for a new cohort that will start in December, and they'll finish a little later. Sorry, just Julio, I don't think your mic is on. I'm We're, so sorry, uh, yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, thank you. Uh, a quick question regarding the um, testing, the COVID testing for the students. How is the absenteeism uh, of these students if they have to stay out? How is that handled in terms of their um, their educational, you know, the time off that they can take from from school? For students who need to quarantine, you're asking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the test and stay program is going to mitigate that so that we don't have to put as many students out. Unfortunately, in the last week or so with after Halloween, we have noticed this week a little spike in the number of students that are being sent home for quarantine. And so we, you know, we're hoping to, you know, try to help work packets, get materials home so that they can do some of that schoolwork and they won't be behind. The teachers are very interested in making sure that they keep up with the lessons when they're home. Okay, so this really won't have, is not counted against them. In it, terms of it, it is an absence. excused absence because you know we're we're asking them to stay home. Okay, thank you. Is that? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Oh, okay. So, is this something that's kind of 
subject to school autonomy, though? I mean, I guess what I'm wondering is it, it feels like as long as we're in the long tail of this pandemic, we're going to have multiple situations on multiple days. I mean, my, my child's been home from school like at least four or five days this year because someone in his class tested positive or he came home with the sniffles and they wouldn't let him back until he had a negative test, et cetera. And, you know, at this point, his school has kind of put something in place where there's a work on Google Classroom that he can log into. Exactly. But I'm is that something that's, like, is there a system for that across the system, or is every school kind of making it up as they go along in terms of how they're going to have, how the kids who are home are going to have consistent access to educational materials? Yeah, we have a group of principals that work closely with our leadership team, the superintendent and, and those of us on the leadership team, and those principals are working on exactly what you're talking about to make sure that we have consistent Google Classroom access across the district, sharing resources, not reinventing the wheel. We learned a lot of great lessons during COVID around, um, you know, how to communicate Class Dojo and other things that we could do to get this information to parents that they need. So, um, you know, that's the silver lining of this is that we have many more email addresses for families now. We can't communicate um, rather easily and, and almost instant instantaneously and we can get them the, the information that they need. Now, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't always help working parents who have to keep a child home. We know that those things are still a struggle. Um, unfortunately, we, we have to protect everybody still. It's, it's, we're not out of the woods, so to yeah, speak. I can but add, I think we're, we're getting better. I can add, Mary, so the guidance across the district is for students to have access to the same materials that students in classroom. To do that, we've had agreements with the union that teachers will provide, whether it is our curriculum has videos that are in line with the units, and so those are uploaded to the Google Classroom, and students can have access to that. And the teacher can communicate with the students via email, phone calls, and through Google Classroom. So the expectation is that all teachers will provide virtual materials for students to have access to it. I, 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 get, I, I understand that this is a bit of a work in progress. I would just say that it, it's not been my experience that that is communicated clearly and proactively when a child is sent home, right? Like I've had to do a lot of proactive outreach on my part to get those materials or to understand where things were or what, so that, that's something that just needs to be worked into the system. I appreciate the feedback. We'll certainly will uh, work on that. Yeah, that's great feedback. And so we can absolutely revisit that so that it is consistent across the district with all students. Pat, go ahead. Hi, Mary, thank you for this um, excellent report. I truly appreciate it. And so what I'm really excited about are the stabilization teams. It's something that we've needed for a long time because in the past, if a child exhibited behavior issues, our only route would be to go through the IEP process. And this gives us more intervention and ability to keep the child in the school and work with him with the behavior issues. So I want to thank you for that and part of the SOA plan, my favorite thing. So thank you. Appreciate that. It's, it's like we, we predicted we were going to need it even more, right? So absolutely, uh, it's, it's coming to fruition. We're very excited about it. If I, if I may, yeah, I mean, I just agreeing with Pat, I mean, that, that one really stood out to me and um, really um, hopeful to see how it goes. And I know that the goal is to have more teams, but I think, the, you know, especially as we've been hearing, uh, at the high school, and I'm sure other schools as well, like kids, you know, um, uh, with, with a lot of need, um, the ability to have this additional expert support to just come in and help identify support for kids. And I mean, it just seems really critical. So, so just, you know, really glad that, that that's launched. I had a couple of just really quick questions back to the, um, the RBT. Um, is, you may have said this with apologies, but this is free for paras. We're, we're partnered we with the agency and we're paying the tuition, 
yep. we're paying the certification cost and the license fee, and we're providing the power with a stipend for doing the 40 hours. Okay, great. So just again, just to say it again back, so it's free to pair us, and then they get a stipend for, for the going through the, the program and, and the work. Correct. Okay, okay that's great. Uh, and then, I mean, it sounds like, just from the description I see of it, it's a... Uh, um, it's just a tremendous value add for our parents to have the skill set to work with BCBA, supporting our kids. Uh, they get the certification, which is, you know, a certification. Um, does it have like a, a tangible benefit in terms of uh, their just financial compensation or anything? In we the haven't district? gotten there yet because we haven't had I see. this particular asset in the past got it so we haven't talked about whether you know this is a new category of paris is an rbt a new category we do have paris working in different groups yep we have some working as instructional paris another group might be para that's working as a crisis para or in a sub separate room got now it. this could be another category of paras that are actually hold the certification of rbt so again, that's something for us okay. to, to consider and talk about moving forward. That's helpful. Uh, and it sounds like, I mean, there, there's been demand. So the 50 plus the new 20. So uh, if this is something we feel as a district strongly, it's going to be a, an important resource. Uh, I like that we're paying for it and giving a stipend. And right, if we, if we need to continue to incentivize or support it, like I think that's great. Um, the other piece is I just wanted to come back to, I think it was on slide A, just those 38 seats. Um, that, that you spoke about. Keeping me up at night. Yeah, I bet. I mean, I'm just trying to think about it, and, and you talked about it, and I know you said that some kids may not show up, and, you know, you, you, I'm just curious. I mean, and you talked about trying to keep those classes to, like, 15, I think you said, or, you know, j just what is current thinking, just thoughts around, you know, do we add a seat in each one? Do you, like, just, I'm just... I know you've thought about this much more than I have, so I'm just yeah. curious, like, what are some of your We're bound thoughts? by the regulations, so okay. we're really capped at 15. Got it. That's, I mean, understanding that half of these children have, um, yeah. you know, an identified special need. So, you know, to grow bigger than that is very difficult for the teacher and the para that's assigned to the room, um, working with those kids. Uh, and, you know, these teachers, they have two groups of these kids a day. They, they have a morning group right. and then they have an afternoon group, so it's quite a load. Um, we're looking at additional space and opportunities where there isn't any, but we're carving it out. Yeah. Uh, superintendent's been looking. We're, we're getting very creative, and um, we're hoping that in January we'll, just the way we did with Lawrence Family, we're going to carve out a few more of these spaces so that we can meet the needs of our kids. So while we weren't evaluating as many last year during the closure, kids continued to turn two and a half. Yeah. You know, that didn't stop happening. So now we have this influx of referrals coming to us from our providers and from families themselves. And, um, you know, we will get it done. I have no doubt. Yeah. So No, thank you. Um, I'm going to use that as a, as a segue to the next item, enrollment, um, just because it affects, I think, probably what you talked about. So, Superintendent, I'll turn it back over to you for, for that. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much. Great. So up next... Denise Snyder is going to be sharing enrollment and attendance update. Hey, good. I don't know if this is on. Good evening. Oh, it is. Uh, it's good to be here again with all of you and um, looking forward to walking through the status of our enrollment for this year. Before I do, I also want to take a moment to introduce Maria Ortiz. You may know her. She has been with the district, I don't want to count how many years, um, but she recently became our enrollment manager. And so Maria has been working really, really hard with the enrollment team all summer into the fall, enrolling, withdrawing, enrolling, withdrawing, and that's going to lead us into talking about the numbers, right? So um, I do want to applaud her and her team for their hard work. So we can talk about the numbers. All right, so um, on this slide, uh, first of all, let me say these numbers are as of November 1st, and I quickly want to talk about that. Normally, we talk about October 1 numbers. Those are the numbers that Desi pulls. Those are the numbers that go up on our website that, you know, or, or their website and live there historically. And we are still certifying 
this year's numbers. So I don't have them. I hoped that we would uh, be able to talk concretely about that. Instead, I've pulled November 1 numbers, which are pretty darn close. I don't think you're going to see much difference. Um, but I want to be transparent that if, you know, a month from now you look at DESI and you're like, but that's not exactly what we said, um, they're still in the certification process. So if we look at this, the very bottom number of total enrollment, if you go to our PowerSchool um, student information system, you would see 13,250 for students and you'd be like, hey, that's not so bad. We uh, went from 13,550 down to 12,824, I think. So we're, we're on our way back. It's not quite as rosy as that yet. Um, you want to look at all of the numbers in between to realize that um, the other uh, categories don't count towards our total DESI enrollment. The children we serve um, in preschool and kindergarten who only receive services as opposed to fully enrolled, um, those who may go to um, a non-public school and also still receive our services um, are out of district enrollment. So some of our substantially separate who might be placed in another district for services. And finally, our students um, who have um, applied for and been approved for homeschooling. That really took us down as of November 1st to 12,999. And I'm a little OCD. If I could have found just one more kid on the street that day, <laughs> it would have made me very, very happy. Um, but you know, we can look at this number in a couple of ways. And so I've done some analysis just so you can look at it from a couple of different perspectives. On this first one, this is strictly the enrollment by grade for this year. And you can see that um, pre-K and kindergarten are different than the other ones. The other ones are all somewhere within their, you know, close margin of error, not margin of error, but close enough to each other. Pre-K, obviously, as we know, and kindergarten are not mandatory, and a lot of our students are enrolled in our um, community partners programs. So you can see that there's a difference before you start to get into what we really look like when we're fully enrolled as full cohorts. And then just as a reminder, grade 13 is really that program um, opportunities for our students who have special needs who are between 18 and age 22. So that's why that number is a low number that usually hovers between 30 and 40 students. Then we could look a little more deeply at enrollment comparisons year over year. So this is by grade. This is about seven years worth of data. Um, if you want to look at comparisons of like, hey, how, what was our kindergarten class like seven years ago versus now? And you can see that a lot of these numbers, um, particularly in the last couple of years, are trending down. Some of the other years, they go up and down, up and down. They vary. Some, some grade levels were exploding. I know I've been here talking about those explosive years. Um, as you'll see in this, there are three bottom lines. The two yellows are two years ago and this year. Two years ago being the last time that we were all in person when we were doing fall enrollment, October 1 numbers, and obviously the current year. And the blue in the middle reflects the fact that we were in remote learning and that, that year is going to look a little different. It's an anomaly, right? So it's hard to look at last year versus this year when probably apples to apples is more two years ago to this year. So we go a little bit further, um, and I've done just a little bit of math for, for folks, and you can see that the enrollment variance by grade, um, actually I have one error on here that I've updated, but I didn't send it to Dave, so I have to eat my error here. Enrollment variance by grade, and I just basically took out the um, remote year, and you can see that in most grades we are down from previous years. We got a couple of ones that were up, although quite frankly, eighth grade should be a negative. Um, nope, that's a positive. One of those, I'm sorry, grade nine. Grade nine should be um, a negative, not a positive. Sorry. So 
story is, though, most grades are down from two years ago. And we're going to talk about why that is. Um, we know that last year in remote learning, our numbers were down. People had to make really hard decisions about what they needed for their children. And as you recall, when we surveyed families, about half said, remote learning, and about half said, I want my children in school. So we bore some of that out last year with families who said, all remote learning? I don't think so, and they found other solutions. This year, I'm gonna jump to it in a few minutes, we're gonna see a little bit different. We're gonna see the other side of the coin in the families who, you know, are, are still concerned about coming in person. Before we do that, I want to show you one more slide, which is one that um, you're used to, although I color-coded it a little bit different. Um, whoops. This is the slide that normally has all the arrows, and I think arrows are hard because they cover up some of the numbers, so I color-coded. So you can just read diagonally. This is cohort. This is not, oh, what was first grade last year, what was first grade this year. This is if you started with us in kindergarten, I'm sorry, if you started with us in first grade, are you still with us in fifth grade? Okay, so you look at it diagonally. Um, we don't include pre-K and kindergarten in this, again, because that's not really when the full co cohort begins. Um, and I did not go into ninth, 10th, and 11th grade because our cohort kind of shifts uh, entering into ninth grade as one of our partner schools, the, uh, the, the, the VOC typically receives a few hundred of our students. So I mostly highlighted the grades in between. Um, this probably does provide the clearest view, though, of students who start with us and stay with us. And so you can see, just to um, point out a couple of examples, first grade cohorts in 2017-18, um, if you look, just two years ago, we were up 19 from that initial number. This year, we're down 36. Second grade, if you look at that cohort, two years ago from, um, from the beginning of this graph, we were down 19. Now we're down 28. So that's how that reads, and you can keep looking at that that way. Um, again, some cohorts are smaller this year even more than they were last year. And that gets back to that other half of the equation where maybe some families are saying, yeah, you might be in person, my kid's not coming in person. And they, again, are making other choices. So not only are we trying to get back families who left us last year, we're now um, addressing and confronting a need that families have right now about maybe not wanting to be in person. So, you know, it looks different than I thought it would when I was here in the, well, <laughs> on Zoom in the spring um, and foolishly thought the pandemic would be behind us, right? So we are looking at numbers that are harder and harder to predict. Having said that, our enrollment number by number is really, really, like the people are pouring in. Unfortunately, what's happening is that we're also seeing a lot of withdrawals. So families who may have come to us and registered in May, in June, in July, even in August, by the time they got to September said, you know what, we're not doing it. And um, that bears out in a couple of ways, but first let me explain how you read this, uh, this chart. So in the top, these are summer withdrawals. This is not even full year withdrawals. Full year withdrawals are pretty much on track as they normally are, but summer, two years ago, we had 699 withdrawals. That's a pretty normal number. That is a typical number for Lawrence migration. Um, Last year, that dropped to 369. So families may have left us, either they didn't enroll at all, or they may have left us, but they also weren't as transient. During the pandemic, a lot of families did not pick up and move. In addition, we um, were able to engage some families in staying with us, even while we let their children learn from anywhere, if you recall. So that kind of kept down the withdrawal numbers from 699 to 369. But here is what happened to our enrollment this year. 
our withdrawals, just summer withdrawals, summer being end of school year until that October 1 cutoff, 913 withdrawals. We did a little bit of the analysis for you. You can see a couple of, of spikes in state transfers or uh, withdrawals, which means they basically went to another school in the state of Massachusetts. They were up 89. So that might speak to the people who might have moved last year but couldn't. Out of state, that's up over 100. Dominican Republic, that number's pretty steady. Again, last year, there wasn't much mobility, but 70 is not far off from where we typically are. Homeschooling, this number skyrocketed. And again, the decision to keep children home, and this is, this is a pre-K kindergarten phenomenon only, um, that number also grew. We always have some families who will look and say, actually, now that I know it's half day, or now that I know that it's an afternoon program, I actually think I'm gonna keep where my kid is or keep them home with me. But that number um, had a sharp increase this year as people you know, made hard decisions and realized that without it being mandatory, maybe it would be another year before they, keep children, before they bring their children to school. So the last bit of analysis here, our view on this is COVID and the variant really have sparked concern about in-person learning for some of our families, the same way last year for some of our families being remote was a problem. It's the other half of the coin, if you will. Um, parents, we know this because parents who could choose to keep their children home, it looks like they did. We see that spike in pre-K and kindergarten. We see that spike in homeschooling. And we see that major increase in overall summer withdrawals. Um, and right now, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about enrollment projections again in the spring. But as long as we're dealing with the pandemic, it's going to be a movable feast. Um, right now, we also are going to be looking to see whether or not January continues. We normally have a small peak there with migrations from DR and Puerto Rico. And we're going to see if that holds true or not. Um, and that we're really going to have to be innovative and creative as we think about our offerings and how we share those offerings with families in terms of you know, recapturing, if you will, um, folks we've lost last year or this year. Um, I also, it's not in your packet, but we were sort of thinking that uh, the last time I talked to you, we did attendance, and you might want a really quick attendance update. So I did add two slides, if you don't mind. I, I'm sneaking them in here for you. Um, again, mixed news, mixed news. Uh, the first slide that you're going to look at, this, I guess if I don't send them to Dave, you can't see them either, can you? All right, I'm going to talk to you about two slides. And then I'm going to share them with you. And I'm going to apologize, because it's best laid plans. Here's what we know, in 10 years, attendance, chronic absenteeism, do you guys remember the conversation of chronic absenteeism, which is 10% or more of enrolled days? That's chronic absenteeism, and it's a problem. Um, Lawrence, like many communities, has a chronic absenteeism problem. Um, and in 2018, was as high as 25.2% of our students. We decided to tackle that problem. Um, we brought it to the Tuvos Council. Um, we talked about it in schools. We shared best practices. We did poster campaigns. And over the last couple of years, we dropped that number down last year to 17.2%. So not bad. It's more than seven points that we shaved off of that. This year, Slightly different story. Um, this year, what we have is the reality that with the pandemic, with people being really challenged about returning to school, um, I think we're just all feeling a lot of stress and our kids are feeling it too. We have chronic absenteeism in just the first 40 days. That chronic absenteeism number is hovering around 34%. It's a big number. 
and can it's a sad number. Can I can I just ask a quick clarifying question? Yeah. Do, do the COVID absences get factored into that? Like, yeah, I if, hear. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Yes, yes. So some of this is COVID. If you're out quarantining, even though it's a level one absence, Mary called it um, excused, but it basically means you get you have the opportunity to continue your learning. We have to mark a student absent in school if they're not physically sitting in school. You know, we do that for a couple of reasons. Actually, Jess, I remember when you and I were on the committee around attendance and we talked about if you're not physically present and there's a fire and we don't note you as absent, we're going to be searching that building for you. You're absent. And your learning is still never going to be 100% as it would be in the classroom. However, it is, as Mary called it, excused or level one absence. But it does impact our numbers. I think my point is right now, it's too early to say how the rest of the year will look. It's the first 40 days. And that whole um, kids getting back into school and some starting a few days late and some trying to find their way um, impacts some of that. Quarantining impacts some of that, but I think we bring this number up, one, because we owe you an update, but two, um, this is a real opportunity for our district to double down as we think about winter. Winter is a challenge in our community. Kids and families wanting to come to school on cold weather days is a challenge, so this is a real opportunity for us to be huddling up and thinking about do we you know, rerun some of those posters that we created a couple of years ago. What are the tricks that we, you know, really worked on in the last five years that we can roll out again? So um, I think I'm going to leave it at that, answer your questions, but know that we know that we have, you know, a lot of hard work ahead of us. Yeah, and can I just pick up on that question just for a second on, um, sorry, well, you say you're going to pick up on it too? Can I ask one or do you want to do Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess a few things. One, the end size, right, in terms of number of days is only 40. So if, you know, I, I hope that with more days and less, like, th that that could be a contributing factor. However, just this point, though, about um, how many are impacted by, you know, just COVID protocol, I think is really, really important because as we're targeting interventions and supports for families, like, knowing that will, you know, like, really you know, the last thing we want to do is send a letter to a family and say, hey, you're chronically absent. They're like, I know, I've, I've kept the kid home. Like, <laughs> yeah, but, but that, you know what I mean? So and I'm yeah. not saying we're going to do that, but I'm just saying like, so that analysis would be helpful also oh, yeah. um, you yep. know, to us as you mm -hmm. think about it. So mm -hmm. Jess, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, that was going to be part of my point. I think it it's, it's going to be really important to disaggregate the COVID protocol absences versus the like, other absences that we might be more concerned about, you know, philosophically speaking or practic or practically speaking, right? So I, I feel like if, if the data could be broken down in those ways, I think that that would be super helpful. And that being said, I do think that, um, I mean, I'm just actually thinking like if we've been in school 40 days, then my son's been chronically absent because he's probably been home with COVID protocols like four days of that 40. So, right. So um, I think that the other thing is that I do absolutely think that we are going to need to kind of re-engage in that attendance campaign, but, and think about, you know, this just speaks to this larger issue of all the ways that families are stressed and disengaged and feeling the effects of the pandemic, like all the reasons that kids had for not coming to school before COVID are, you know, doubled now. And so we, yeah. we do have to think about some ways of addressing that. Thank you, we do. I'm thinking whether um, transportation was also an issue. Um, there's a lot of the students that were not able to or were not getting transported to school in the first 40 days. I know that a lot of that has been addressed. It's also an indirect, uh, you know, uh, cause of COVID. So I'm not sure how to really separate that from COVID absences, but. Uh, it's a good point. It's a very good point for us to consider if, if we're able to break down the data, COVID, transportation, 
really stand up as things we need to consider. Thanks, Pat, go ahead. Denise, just a quick question. I'm trying to do my math here. Did we lose more kids this year from eighth to nine um, going to the Vogue school? Just the Vogue, I don't have the breakdown in front of me, but we did present it last spring and I believe a little bit more. It was not dramatically more if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. These numbers here are not going to be just Vogue. These are gonna be all like that, what you see um, on some of these slides when you see the decrease from eighth to ninth or nine over nine even are not strictly Vogue. I mean, Vogue takes up a couple hundred, but it's also, you know, Central Catholic. It's some of the other Catholic schools in Methuen and Haverhill. Um, it's a couple of, you know, the private schools. Although, you know, obviously, uh, Greater Lawrence is, is the larger piece of that. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Great. Just, just sorry, just a minor question, because look at the the twelfth grade that, that that's really interesting the fact that we're you know we're, we we've added students when comparing you know twelfth graders two years ago to this year but then when you look at I don't know I'm I'm still looking at the cohort data you know like it, mm -hmm. I don't know like that jump I mean what, what's just interesting like if you've sort of thought about what what's going on there I have not, to be honest, um, and it is. It's a significant jump, and it is. Thank you for bringing it out. It's worth worth our sitting down with some of the high school enrollment and reengagement folks. Some of this could be reengagement. You know, we really have doubled down on a Saturday school and a couple of other programs, and that really could be speaking to that program. So that is, those are numbers that we can look at a little more closely and bring back. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move us on, but, you know, just want to pause for a second as well, because this is your last meeting with us. Uh, and I know your time with the district is, is soon coming to an end. And, and I was sad to hear that and sorry to hear that, that you were moving on. But also, you know, uh, just want to support you and congratulate you on your next step and just appreciate all the work that you've done and, and you've interacted with this board quite a bit and we've asked you a lot of questions and, and asked you to come back with more information and you always have and, and just, you know, thank you for everything that you've done and I wish you the best of luck, even though I wish you were staying, but I wish you the best of luck. Uh, and just again, thanks for, for everything you've done for us. I can't thank you all enough. <laughs> I honestly Can I? can't thank all of you enough. Um, Lawrence is, is absolutely 100% where my heart is right now. Um, and it has been just a genuine pleasure and, um, as I told the superintendent, really an opportunity of a lifetime for me. This has been an amazing, amazing experience. So thank you for the kind wishes, but also really thank you for letting me be part of you know all the work we've been doing here. Thank you. I I just I, I feel I have to say too just as a community partner that has worked really closely with you over the past number of years it's been an awesome experience and always a pleasure like your intelligence and dedication and competence and professionalism and willingness to solve problems and move things forward and you know dedication to family engagement has been really awesome it's been a a really great thing to have for the school. So we will miss you a lot. Thank you so much. I'm going to go on to do beautiful things here. I'm just excited for all of you, but honestly, my, my, my heart is always going to be here now with uh, mi amigos. So gracias. Yeah. Thank you. All right. And the final item, Superintendent, on your report is the fiscal 23 budget process. Great, so we wanted to start, believe it or not, the launch of the new fiscal year. I'm just going to share with you the timeline because it'll be upon us quite quickly. All right, next month, we're gonna start our internal process. You're quite familiar with that. We're also going to be engaging with the budget subcommittee, so Ventura will address that later today. As 
You all remember that means that we're going to be drafting some district-wide priorities. We'll also have you all give you an update on the priorities that we drafted last year and the year before that as a comparison. Then schools, of course, are going to get to the busy work of designing their budgets based on the district-wide priorities and based on the needs of their students. That's going to roll up into the larger budget that later we will come back to the public for hearings and to you all for a larger discussion and a final larger budget. We expect, of course, that the process ends more or less in May, June, at the very latest at the City Council. So these are just, again, reminders of what the Budget Subcommittee does. These are the goals that we will be co-creating those budget goals, those priorities. And then, of course, we ask them to approve the final budget and to co-facilitate the process throughout this, the, the, uh, the fiscal year. Here it is, just a nitty-gritty reminders of how we break it down every month. And as I said, it's hard to believe, but it'll commence next month. Yeah, so just outlining it again so that then when we have the conversation in December, it doesn't catch anybody by surprise talking about what do you mean budget already? <laughs> uh, thank you. And, and um, you know, to support that, we, we do have a budget committee. Uh, and, in the, and it's been now three years, I think, pretty, pretty you know, consistent in terms of the, the membership. Uh, that's Julia, Dan, and Pat that I think have been consistently on it. This year I've also asked Maria uh, to join that committee. I think it's just a good way, especially for a new member, to sort of get a full picture of the district. And um, so those four folks will be serving on the on the budget committee for, for this year. Um, I will say, and you'll notice, I'm not officially on it. I'm planning on going to every meeting. Uh, and I say that because every board member is invited to every meeting. So feel free to show up and participate. Um, but I figured at least having an official one of four, you know, I'll be there, but invite anyone to show up as well. Great, thank you. All right, I think that's it, right? So before we move into our executive session, um, I also want to ask, um, we'd like to get a student, uh, and this is typically the time of year where we've had a student uh, member. Uh, Jess, I know you've been involved with that in the past and knowing me, so I would ask if uh, the two of you uh, would be able to engage with the district, you know, just to help select the student. That would be great. Um, and you all can work on a timeline. Uh, There's a pretty, I know you've followed a process in the past, and we'd love to get a student uh, on the board uh, as soon as possible. So um, we are going to go into executive session. One more update I just want to provide. So as um, I think I've been mentioned last meeting, um, you know, I had reached out to the to the Lawrence School Committee uh, with the offer of providing training, providing the possibility of joint meetings, like if we sort of sat and planned that out. Uh, we made that request in September, uh, and I'm glad to say that about two weeks ago I got a response, uh, and so uh, I have an initial just conversation planned for tomorrow with the member that I think they asked to represent that. But I just want to preview that I my, my vision for this is that we'd have a, a group of LAE members, potentially with school committee members, jointly planning. And so tomorrow is just an initial call to say, you know, glad, you know, we're sort of starting to talk. Uh, but I will be asking likely for some people who want to help just think through. And, you know, we want to hear from them around what do they want for training and what topics and um, the Department of Education's offer to pay for that. So that's good. Uh, but I feel like, you know, we have a role to support the uh, school committee in naming and getting the training that, that they want, feel like they need, and then also discuss the possibility of joint meetings and what that looks like. And, you know, um, I, I just think that's important um, for, in terms of what's in our control, what we can do to help support that group, you know, in, uh, in their ongoing development. Um, so just wanted you all to know that. Uh, I'll update you and uh, we'll likely be asking for volunteers to help me think through that with, with members of that group. So, all right, uh, in a second, I'm going to ask for a motion to go into executive session. And this is, uh, you know, the, the reason we're going into executive session is primarily a, a sort of a, a technical issue in that we discuss this sort of matter in executive session um, to then um, 
advise our attorneys to sort of respond on our behalf. So I just wanted to say that out loud. And the executive session, you know, is listed on here, um, you know, relates to an open meeting law complaint and just determining our response as a board. And again, that's held in executive session because it represents a complaint against the public body members as individual public officials. So that's why we have to go in executive session for that. Ventura, before Please. we go into executive session, can I suggest that we approve the minutes in this way? Yes, thank you. Before Sorry, that, that was totally out of order. Yes, thank you. Um, do I have a, a motion to approve the October 13th, 2021 minutes? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Uh, do you have a motion to approve the October 20th, 2021 minutes? So moved. Second? Second. All right. Any discussion? Just, uh, I just have one quick, my, my name was, my vote wasn't included at the, uh, the last motion to adjourn. Okay. So I'll just add that up. And oh, it's really great, good. great. So if we add that, that, that seems, it's only correction? Yeah. Great. That's it. What, what was the correction? Um, just that um, Maria's name wasn't added at, at the end with the motion to adjourn. Her vote wasn't recorded. Oh. Okay. So we'll, we'll adjust that. So with that adjustment, um, I'll go ahead and take a roll call for, I'm sorry, I'll go ahead and take a vote for the October 20, 2021 minutes with the addition of, um, of Maria's vote. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. aye. Any opposed? And, and I voted aye, by the way. I, I, I'm not quite voting what I call it. So great. Thank you. All right, now I'll entertain a motion. And just for the record, we will not be returning to open session. We'll be adjourning uh, the meeting from executive session. So do I have a motion to enter executive session? So moved. Second? Second. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? All right, so thank you. We'll be signing off now from the live stream. And, and thank you. And, and if you're you know not involved in this, I ask that you please depart. Thank you.